Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. During this short applications exercise, we're going to build a functional circuit in the motor controls trainer board we've been slowly building upon by wiring up the two-wire magnetic motor starter hand-off auto circuit we introduced in the hand-off auto circuit lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. Additionally, this exercise operates under the presumption you have watched the preceding lectures detailing the progressive construction of the motor controls trainer board. Recall that manual motor starters serve as direct means of making or breaking connection to a motor, as well as protecting the motor from sustained overload conditions. Note manual motor starter circuits do not necessitate the use of pilot level ladder logic because the operator directly makes or breaks connection to the primary circuit. Other more complicated applications, however, require more complicated automatic control and necessitate pilot level control circuits. Recall one of the two wire magnetic motor starter handoff auto circuits as implemented in the above reference lecture used a maintained contact three position selector switch and a float switch to control the operation of a motor driven pump. An operator could place the circuit in one of three modes, auto where the float switch automatically controls the motor, hand, which turns the motor on whether the float switch calls for it or not, or off, which halts the motor even if the float switch closes. To make this exercise compatible with a lab environment, we'll subtly modify the circuit as follows. First, the normally open float switch will be swapped out from momentary contact normally open push button. This removes the necessity of having a tank full of water in an electronics lab. Always a bad idea. The momentary contact normally open push button is essentially a simulated float switch. When the push button isn't being pressed, the float switch isn't being triggered. When the push button is being pressed, the float switch is being triggered. Before we begin, let me remind you I am not an electrician and you cannot use anything in this or any other lecture as professional electrical advice. Follow the rules. Follow the code. It's there for a reason to protect people and property from hazards arising from the use of electricity. Some of the material and techniques you may see in this lecture may not be utilized for a permanent approved installation, but is for demonstration purposes only. This content has been developed for edification only. While reasonable care has been exercised with respect to its accuracy, I assume no responsibility for errors, omissions, or suitability for any application or misapplication of its contents. Let us begin. First, we need to establish a start state and assemble the necessary components. We've already built a base motor controls trainer board. The base state consists of a circuit breaker, control transformer, and manual motor starter. You'll need to remove any and all previous circuit connections and return it to just the circuit breaker, control transformer, and manual motor starter. During the wiring and alarm circuit lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we added a maintain contact three position selector switch, momentary contact push button, and two pilot lamps. We'll be making use of these components for this exercise as well. Next, we need to assemble a three-pole contactor, an overload relay, and an auxiliary contact block. We won't use the auxiliary contact block this particular exercise. However, we will install it today and make use of it in later lectures. The three-pole contactor has a coil from terminals A1 to A2. The ohmmeter indicates the coil is intact with a value of approximately 370 ohms. The coil will be energized or de-energized by the pilot level voltage provided by the control transformer. The primary contacts L1 to T1, L2 to T2, and L3 to T3 are normally open in nature. The ohmmeter indicates no connection. When the coil is energized or if the manual override is triggered, the ohmmeter indicates the primary contacts close. These primary contacts selectively connect or disconnect an industrial three-phase AC motor from the supply voltage. The three-pole contactor additionally features a normally open auxiliary contact from terminals 1-3 to 1-4 rated for pilot voltage. Since we're constructing a two-wire control circuit, we won't be making use of this auxiliary contact since two-wire control circuits ordinarily do not make use of a holding contact. Later exercises on three-wire control circuits We'll, however, make use of this auxiliary contact as a holding contact that maintains the last asserted state. The auxiliary contact block is a collection of additional pilot level contacts that attaches to the front of the contactor. Again, 
we won't be making use of the auxiliary contact block this particular exercise, but later lectures will make use of the enhanced functionality offered by the additional pilot level contacts. In this case, the auxiliary contact block offers two normally open and two normally closed contacts. The auxiliary contact block slides onto the tab front of the contactor and clips in place. When the contactor coil is energized, the mechanically interlocked auxiliary contact blocks also change states. The overload element is designed such that it links with the contactor, forming a compact motor starter. Before doing so, let's examine the connections and face of the overload. The overload features primary connections, L1 to T1, L2 to T2, and L3 to T3. The primary L connections are visible on the top left-hand side. The three primary T connections are on the bottom of the device. The overload features two pilot level auxiliary contacts on the front, a normally closed contact from 95 to 96 on the outside, and a normally open contact from 97 to 98 on the inside. The extra connections on the top are designed to link up with the auxiliary and coil terminals on the contactor, thus allowing these terminals to remain accessible when the contactor and overload pair are mechanically linked together. You'll appreciate the cunningness of this arrangement when we wire this circuit in a moment. The overload features a reset mode selector on the left hand side and an adjustable overload setting on the right hand side. The reset selector has four modes, auto, auto with external test, hand with external test, and hand. Those settings with an external test allow a technician to trigger the overload by pressing the test button on the front of the overload. Those settings without an external test disable the test button in the front of the overload. Automatic resets will automatically reset the pilot level contacts after the overload elements have cooled. A hand or manual reset requires an operator to acknowledge the overload condition and manually reset it after an overload has occurred. For the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to keep it in hand with external tests. To link the pair, the contactor and overload clip together in the back and then the wires slide into the matching terminals. Sheer genius. Believe me, not all manufacturers make it this easy. We have assembled a motor starter, being a means of connecting and disconnecting a motor from primary voltage, the contactor, and a means of protecting the motor from sustained overload conditions, the overload. Let's test the pair. An ohmmeter indicates no connection between the primary contacts when the contactor coil is de-energized. When the contactor is manually triggered, the ohmmeter indicates the primary contacts have closed. Note the overload element does not break the primary connection in the event of an overload. That is the role of a contactor. The overload is a sensory element only and the pilot level contacts tell the contactor when to open. The normally closed contact from 95 to 96 provides this feedback. An ohmmeter indicates that this pilot level contact is closed as expected when the overload is not triggered. When the overload is manually tested, the ohmmeter indicates this contact opens. All right, I do believe we are ready to build this circuit. We really have two separate circuits to build, the pilot ladder logic and the primary circuit. Our previous applications exercises were only single level circuits. The alarm circuit exercise only made use of pilot level switches and indicators. The manual and manual reversing motor starter exercises only had primary circuits that were directly connected or disconnected by an operator. This is really our first two level circuit that makes use of pilot level elements to control the state of primary devices. Note I've cleaned up the diagram by not showing the control transformer. Let's begin by assembling the pilot level circuit. After we wire up the ladder logic, we'll come back and connect the primary devices. Building the circuit in this order allows a technician to test or troubleshoot the pilot level ladder logic without worrying about the primary devices like the motor. First, let's make our job easy by inserting terminal and wire numbers on our ladder logic diagram using the skills we established in the Ladder Logic documentation lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. By all means, pause the lecture and take your best shot. If you numbered the terminals and wires correctly, your Ladder Logic diagram should look something like this. Note wire 1 is the left-hand vertical upright, and wire 2 is the right-hand vertical upright. Next, see if you can mentally walk yourself through this circuit using the skills I demonstrated in the Wiring the Alarm Circuit lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you'll recall, I emphatically recommended you wire a ladder logic diagram, left to right, top to bottom, rung by rung. By all means, pause the lecture and do so. 
ask yourself where the wire of interest comes from and where the wire of interest goes to in that rung and that rung only. Continue in this fashion left to right. Only when you land at the grounded X2 side of the control transformer is that rung complete and you are allowed to move down to the next rung. This saves you a lot of second guessing and backtracking and ensures a completed functional product at the end. Start establishing good work practices now. Quick hint, wire numbers are best thought of as nodes. You'll note wire 4 is a pooled connection and only convenience dictates which terminal is physically employed to the best advantage. You cannot make this decision until you're actually physically wiring up the real circuit. All right, with your mental tour complete, let's begin wiring up this circuit. See if your initial assumptions match how I wire this up. Start by making sure the system is safe to work on. Open the manual motor starter. Open the circuit breaker. Unplug it, lock out the plug, and tag it out. Let's start wiring rung one. Wire one comes out of the control transformer X1 terminal. Note I'm using the terminal block to make my life easy. Wire one goes into the two three terminal of the normally open selector switch auto contact. Wire three comes out of the 2-4 terminal of the normally open selector switch, auto contact. Wire 3 goes into the 2-3 terminal of the normally open push button, our simulated float switch. Wire 4 comes out of the 2-4 terminal of the normally open push button, our simulated float switch. Only concerning myself with rung 1 destinations, wire 4 goes into the A1 terminal of the contactor coil. Here's where you get to appreciate the cunningness of this particular manufacturer. Wire 5 comes out of the still accessible A2 terminal of the contactor coil. Wire 5 then goes right into the conveniently available 9-5 terminal of the normally closed overload contact. 2. Easy. Wire 2 comes out of the 96 terminal of the normally closed overload contact. Wire 2 goes back to the control transformer grounded X2 side. Note I'm using the terminal block to make my life easy. Rung 1 and rung 1 only is done. We can now move on to rung 2. Rung 2 also starts with wire 1. Given wire 1 is better thought of as a node, we have two options available and only convenience dictates our choice. I could start either from the X1 terminal of the control transformer or the 2-3 terminal of the normally open selector switch auto contact. Since my destination is the nearby 4-3 terminal of the normally open selector switch hand contact, I'm going to start at the 2-3 terminal of the normally open selector switch auto contact. Wire 1 comes out of the 2-3 terminal of the normally open selector switch auto contact. Wire 1 goes into the 4-3 terminal of the normally open selector switch hand contact. Wire 4 comes out of the 4-4 terminal of the normally open selector switch hand contact. Where does wire 4 go? I've got two choices. Either the 2-4 terminal of the normally open push button or simulated float switch or the A1 terminal of the contactor coil. It doesn't matter. They're both the same pooled connection offered by wire 4. However, I'm going to choose the 2-4 terminal of the push button since it's closer than the contactor coil. Don't waste wire. Don't waste time. Wire 4 goes into the 2-4 terminal of the normally open push button, our simulated float switch. Rung 2 is done, as is our pilot level ladder logic. Notice how moving left to right, top to bottom, we never had to backtrack or ran the risk of an open or short-circuited rung. Use this method and you'll have a greater chance of success in less time. Don't use this method and you'll have a greater chance of failure in more time. Your choice. Let's introduce one minor modification to our pilot level ladder logic. Let's include a green pilot lamp in parallel to the contactor coil and overload. This pilot lamp isn't functionally necessary. However, it can be used to test and troubleshoot the pilot level ladder logic independent from the primary circuit. We can use an additional wire 4 from the 2-4 terminal of the normally open push button, our simulated float switch, and route it to terminal 1 of the green pilot lamp. Wire 2 comes out of terminal 2 of the green pilot lamp and is routed back to the control transformer X2 terminal. Let's now build the primary circuit. This is pretty easy. The plug, circuit breaker, and motor starter are already wired in series with one another, and the contactor and overload are already interlocked together. All we've got to do is route three wires out of the manual motor starter. The black, red, and blue wires serve this purpose. These same three wires go into the L1, L2, and L3 inputs of the contactor and overload assembly. 
three wires come out of the bottom T1, T2, and T3 outputs of the overload. These wires are routed to the terminal block on our motor mount base. That's it. Our two-wire magnetic motor starter hand-off auto circuit is ready to rock. Make sure the three-position selector switch is in the center off position. Let's test just the pilot level ladder logic by opening the manual motor starter. When the system is unlocked, plugged in, and only the circuit breaker is closed, the pilot level circuit does a whole lot of nothing. That's the point. The three position selector switch is in the off position. Even if our simulated float switch is activated, the pilot lamp and motor don't respond. When the three position selector switch is rotated to the auto position, the pilot lamp and motor still don't respond because the simulated float switch hasn't called for it. Only when the simulated float switch closes does the contactor close and the pilot lamp come on. Note the motor does not energize because the manual motor starter is open. The manual motor starter therefore allows us to functionally isolate the pilot and primary circuit for test and troubleshooting purposes. When the simulated float switch opens, the contactor opens and the pilot lamp goes off. Finally, when the three position selector switch is rotated to the hand position, the contactor closes and the pilot lamp goes on, even though the float switch is not activated. The hand position allows an operator to override the automatic nature of the system for test purposes or perhaps bypass a malfunctioning float switch. Again, note the motor doesn't energize because the manual motor starter is open, thereby allowing us to functionally isolate the pilot and primary circuit for test and troubleshooting purposes. Now let's test both the pilot and primary circuit. Return the three position selector switch back to the center off position. When the system is unlocked, plugged in, and both the circuit breaker and manual motor starter are closed, the motor does a whole lot of nothing. That's the point. The three position selector switch is in the off position. Even if the simulated float switch is activated, the motor doesn't respond. When the three position selector switch is rotated to the auto position, the motor still doesn't start because the simulated float switch hasn't called for it. Only when the simulated float switch closes does the contactor close and energize the motor. When the simulated float switch opens, the contactor opens and the motor free spins to a halt. The auto position therefore allows the float switch to automatically control the circuit. Finally, when the three position selector switch is rotated to the hand position, the contactor closes and the motor starts, even though the float switch is not being activated. The hand position therefore allows an operator to override the automatic nature of the system for test purposes or perhaps to bypass a malfunctioning float switch. Our two-wire magnetic motor starter hand-off auto circuit functions as intended. Let's examine some of the peculiarities associated with two-wire control circuits and systems intended for automatic operation. Recall that two-wire control circuits are low or no voltage release circuits and that if power is lost and restored, the system can suddenly start if the automatic input is still being triggered at the time of power up. Consider what happens in auto mode when the simulated float switch is activated and the circuit breaker opens. As predicted, the contactor opens and the motor free spins to a halt. However, if the simulated float switch remains closed when power is restored, the motor suddenly energizes. Any technician investigating this halted motor has the possibility of being injured or killed. It is for this reason lockout and tagout procedures are such an important daily practice. Additionally, consider a two-wire control circuit making use of an overload in the automatic reset mode. In this case, I'm simulating an overload event by pushing the manual test button. The overload element signals the contactor to open as expected. Note the pilot lamp is still lit. When the overload element in automatic mode cools, i.e. when I stop testing it, it automatically resets. If the simulated float switch is still being triggered, again the motor springs to life unexpectedly. Any technician investigating this overloaded motor has the possibility of being injured or killed. Again, proper lockout and tagout procedures would prevent such an unfortunate occurrence from happening. All right, this about wraps up this brief applications exercise. In conclusion, we built a two-wire magnetic motor starter hand-off auto circuit using our previously constructed motor controls trainer board, including a contactor and an overload element. Cost for this setup was pretty minimal. Additions to the base motor controls trainer board include a contactor, auxiliary contact block, and overload. Part numbers appear in the orientation of the motor controls trainer kit and in the information section of this video. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. 
Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.